can't see a thing. Awesome. We'll take a moment, and uh, tonight's going to be way, way different than normal, and so we're just going to kind of, we're going to get through this offering portion of our night. Let's just go ahead and do this. I want to pray with you real quick, and then um, we're going to get into a, a different evening than we're used to, and so I just want to take a moment. Some of you give in baskets, some of you give in the box, some of you give on the computer, however you do it, it's fine. Feel no pressure when we pass the basket around, but there's some that will enjoy the basket, and so I want to give you the opportunity to be obedient to God's Word. Lord, um, we want to thank you for letting us gather here tonight. Thank you for all my friends and family that are here. I thank you for the opportunity to partner with you to share the good news of your son Jesus to the world. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bless our giving tonight. Help us to be uh, obedient to your word, which tells us that each of us, according to our own heart, should set aside a portion each week. And so, Lord, whatever it is that your spirit has told us, uh, as far as our giving is concerned, I pray right now, Lord, that you help us to be obedient to your call on our heart. Whatever that amount is, whether it be less than 10, more than 10, whatever, if it's, it, whatever it is, Lord, just speak to your people, help us to be obedient, and then use this offering to bless the kingdom, bless this community in Jesus' name. Amen. So just go ahead and pass that out, please. Please. Um, while they're doing that, I'm just going to say that um, you, you might be wondering why the band is still up there. That's going to be part of our different night, so bear with me. Um, they're going to be up there joining us all evening. Um, not going to be a whole lot of need to be digging into your Bibles tonight, but I do want to make sure that you um, test me. And I want you to write these verses down and, and, and check them out later on if you'd like. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to be singing the whole night. As I'm sharing things with you that the Lord has put on my heart to share with you, there's going to be time when I stop and they're going to actually sing and give you an opportunity to respond to what you've heard and spend some time with God. So it won't be music at the beginning. It won't be music at the end. It's going to be music throughout. So... That's why you see the band still up on the stage. Okay, um, it, um, I'm going to just kind of jump right in. Uh, Christmas is upon us, and, and it's an interesting time of year. And uh, it's not Christmas until people start getting hurt in Walmart. And, and they have. They've started getting hurt in Walmart. There's actually, I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but there's actually a website. This is, you know... Joy to the world, man, I'll tell you. It's called blackfridaydeathcount.com. There's actually a website that, that, that actually will put the statistics down and let you know who's getting hurt on Black Friday. And so there was a person that got shot at a Walmart because of a, because of a parking space. They haven't even gotten the store yet. Uh, two people got stabbed in another Walmart, I think it's in Wisconsin, over a parking space. So you know, you know, tis the season to be jolly. Everyone's really in a good mood. People are getting shot and stabbed and killed at Walmart. As of uh, yesterday, the death count uh, that's been reported was seven on Black Friday. It was awesome. And then I think there was like uh, 98 injuries. Okay, they didn't die, but they were injured severely. But... Um, Anyway, so it's the Christmas season, and, and I'm not going to, you know, blister Santa Claus and do the normal church thing and, and all that. Um, I just want to, I just want to share some things with you that I, that I think that are, are necessary. I, um, I remember growing up, as many of you know, I'm not, I wasn't Christian when I was a kid. I'm Jewish, you know, so I didn't have Christmas like y'all do. I had, I'm going to say it right, yeah, Hanukkah. I'll try it again. Hanukkah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And, uh, but, you know, I, 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 like the rest of us, you know, when you're a kid, whether it's Christmas or, I'll just go American on you, Hanukkah, whether it's Christmas or Hanukkah, you want to celebrate the true meaning of the holiday, which is, of course, getting presents. And so I wanted presents like anybody else, and I didn't have the opportunity to make my Christmas list out for old St. Nick, but I would have things that I wanted just like anybody else. And so I had stuff, and you know, when you're a kid, you, you have your list, and you want this toy, and you want that toy, and you know, we all have our list of toys that we want, stuff that we want. Um, but it's amazing, though, 
it, for those of us that have kind of sort of grown up a little bit, and I know we're not all there, myself included, but just find that your Christmas list sort of changes over the years. Don't you agree? I mean, now it's, it's totally different than when I was a kid, you know? Now I, I want the new iPhone, which is not true, but I, um, my Christmas list is different. You know, my, my kids and your kids have a Christmas list with toys, games, but our Christmas list might be a little bit different. Maybe our Christmas list has hopes and dreams and aspirations for our kids. Like, I want my kids to be successful, but I don't mean make a lot of money. I don't mean that they even have to go to college, because and you, some of you might think I'm crazy. I don't care if they go to college. I really don't. What I want them to do is if they decide that they want to be uh, a garbage collector, if they want to be a, an employee at McDonald's, if they want to be a doctor, if they want to be an attorney, if they want to be a preacher, if they want to be an insurance agent, if they want to be whatever and the list, it doesn't matter. I just want them to love the Lord and I want them to work diligently at what they do with good character. I want our boys to be good husbands and dads. I want our girls to be wonderful young ladies, and if the Lord sees fit, that they'll be great wives and moms. Like, I don't care about school. I want them to be successful in those things. So I have hopes and dreams and aspirations for my kids, and I'm sure you guys, you do too. Um, and those of us that don't have kids, you will have those hopes and dreams for your kids, just like all of us, like I'm a kid still, like my parents have, I'm, well, they had hopes and dreams for me. I've pretty well busted all of those. Like, I haven't accomplished a single one, especially this Christian thing. I've totally failed them. <laughs> Look, I am, yeah. Um, but, but I'm a kid, and I have, you know, my parents have hopes and dreams for me, I'm sure, as well. But my point is this, is that as the years have gone by, my, my Christmas wish list has changed dramatically. And I want to share with you my Christmas wish list now, my Christmas wish list, and this, please don't take this in a condescending manner, because some of you in this room are older than I, so you're not my children. But four years ago, we started this church, and so I, I still feel the same way about you guys as I do about my own kids, because I have hopes and dreams and aspirations for you, and I want to see great things here. I want to see God do great things here with you and with us for the world. Like, I, I have that. So please don't take these as condescending. They're true. They're real. And, and, and here's the thing. Um, when I read you this list, and there's nine things. When I read you this list, it's a nice list. But the reason why I have this list is because the air that I breathe is the polar opposite of what this list is. That's why this list exists. Because in my day-to-day, I see the pain and the suffering and the strife and the marriages that are a disaster and the kids that are a wreck and the addictions and the problems and I get the phone calls. I have Facebook. I know what's going on. I heard of another couple that we love. You've seen it on Facebook today. Split. It's crazy. I see the pain. I feel the pain in you. I know it. We all share it because we're family and we feel the pain of, our, of each other's problems. I mean, we do. We're family. And so I have this Christmas wish list because I want to see things get better. And I bet you my list intersects your list in some way too. And I want to share this list with you. And then we'll get into the scriptures. Are you good? good. Okay. I have a really short attention span, so you've got to bear with me. <laughs> Thank you, Vernon. Here's my, here's my Christmas wish list. The first on my list includes you, but includes many more. It's part of the vision that I believe God has given me for our church, and that is I want to see every single person in the Golden Triangle love Jesus. That's what I want to see. I want every single citizen, man, woman, and child that lives in Mount Dora, Tavares, and Eustace, and beyond, but this is where we are. We can impact beyond that. There's some folks that come to our church that don't live in that golden triangle there's some people that watch us online that certainly don't live in the golden triangle they they live in different parts of the country and that's fine too so we want to impact but my desire 
is to see every single person in the Golden Triangle love Jesus Christ. That is my heart's desire. And I know that's kind of a crazy thing, right? I mean, all of us want to have like a successful business and we want to have our piece of the pie. I really want the pie to be the entire Golden Triangle. And I know that's like a, that's a, that's a big thing, like wow, every single person, but yeah, I do. And, and, and I'd, like to, I'd like to die trying and I'd like to, if you to join me in that. Like I'd like to see that happen. This is not something that's happening yet. But the whole point of vision is to take something that's unseen and see that it becomes seen. That's what I'd like to see happen. Now the second, that's my first thing, and that, everything kind of attaches to that. But the second one is this, and it's not for everybody out there. It's for everybody in here. And, and, I, and I'm going to be honest, and I've always been very honest with you, and I'm just going to be very blunt you see tonight, very small group of you here, right? And it concerns me because I don't know that Jesus Christ is the love of everyone's life. And I'd like to see everyone here in this church have Jesus Christ at the center of their life. That everyone here, that you would love Jesus Christ with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. That's my, that's my dream. Um, there's a verse in scripture, it's 1 Peter 5, 2, and it just says this, and I've taken it to heart. I read it years and years ago, and it's been really, really impacting to me, and it just says this, care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. And when he says care for the flock, that means I should like care about you, but care for you too. Like serve you, help you, do you know what I'm saying? So in both ways, like I should care what happens, but I also need to take care of. And so we need to do that. And so I have a special affinity for you guys. It sounds like the church line that's ringing. Is there? It's probably those crazy Presbyterians going nuts over there. That choir, they're rocking it, buddy. So anyway, I, I, want, I want all of you to love Jesus Christ with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. The reason why I, I mentioned about the people that are not here, and I don't want to ever like, harp on them, but I know that I'm not everybody. Thank God. That was a good place for thank God. And now everyone's not me. But here, you, know, whew, you can do this, right? I'm going to keep beating this drum until the Lord tells me not to. Specifically, it has to be him saying it. None of y'all. This needs to be a priority. And, and, and when, when you don't, when you're not here because of, and you name it, unless you're like in the hospital. Like Frank, he's got a reason not to be here. Apparently he's in the hospital still. Y'all need to pray for him. We don't know. Yeah, he's a slacker, ain't he? You know what room he's in yet? Uh, 219. 219, Frank Gentile. Yeah. Yeah. What? He's Waterman, right? What's the room again? 219. He's an infection. I didn't even know he was there. He, I knew he went, but I know he was still there. So now I find out. So we'll go. We'll visit. But unless that's a legit reason, what gets in the way? What gets in the way? If you truly love your spouse, like truly love your spouse with all your heart, what would get in the way of you spending time with her or him? You're not supposed to say anything right now, just to give you some advice. That's a great place to say nothing would get in the way of that, honey. Right? And it's the same thing with the Lord, but even more so. So when I say I want the, everybody here to love the Lord Jesus, I mean it, and I think there's some lack there. Here's the third one. I want you to believe that Jesus and his ways are best for you. And that all other things and all other ways aren't as good. Let me just read through these. Number four, I want that belief right there. I want the, that, that you believe that Jesus and his ways are the best for you. I want that to manifest itself. In, in, in this, I want to be able to see. This is my list now. That's why I'm saying a lot of I. I want to be able to see in the people of Revolution Church a, a, a crazy, earnest, burning, go after him pursuit of Jesus Christ. That, that's what I want to see. I want to see that so bad. Like it, it literally does keep me up at night. And I hope, listen, I, I hope I'm not cursing you bad. I hope it keeps you up at night. 
that that's what you want to see, not only in yourself, but in the people that you call your church family. I want to see you up at night because you can't stand it. You need to pursue him. I heard from someone who comes to this church that the other night woken up at like three in the morning because they said the Lord woke them up and they had all this time with him and they meditated on him and they talked to him. And I love that. I love that. Uh, I'd like to see more of that. Um, here's the fifth one. This is dear to my heart. I want to see you. I want to see people want to study the Word of God. I want to see people uh, not only want to study the Word of God, but I want people to to value this. I want to see that the, va- the your opinion of this word of this book increases dramatically. And not only would I like to see you study words God, uh, God's word and to value God's word, I'd like to see you all teaching God's word. See, the Bible says that we're a holy nation of priests. You see that? See, I'm not the priest. We are the priests, right? We're all the priests. It's a priesthood, and that means all of us don't come in and listen to one guy up here sharing God's word as like the priest. No, y'all are the priests. Did you know that you're a priest? Did you know that you're a priest? Did you know that, Ben? We're a holy nation. You're a priest. You believe in Jesus Christ? Awesome, you're a priest. Isn't that good? I know, you're a priest, you're a priest. Michael, you're a priest. Dan, Katie, you're a priest. We're all priests, right? We're a holy nation of priests, and so you're not supposed to come in here and just listen to me talk to you, right? You're supposed to go out and you're supposed to study the Word of God, you're supposed to value the Word of God, and gosh darn it, you're supposed to teach the Word of God. All of us, every single one of us. That's what I'd like to see happen. That's part of my Christmas wish list. Let me go on. Um, I want to see a deeper concern about sin in our church. So this is very personal. I want to see a deeper concern about sin in our church. What does that look like? What it looks like is twofold. That's a higher tolerance of it in other people. And I know that's tough, but we need to have a higher tolerance of the sin in other people. You can't be going, oh, I can't believe you did this. Sin in the mirror, right, guys? Sin in the mirror. Okay, so it's twofold. A higher tolerance for other people's sin and less involvement in sin on our own, with us. Way flippant attitude in our church. And that blocks God from working in us with this sin. The, 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 well, we're going to get into that a little bit later. I don't want to the cat, let the cat out of the bag. Um, I'd like to see uh, number seven is a, a greater level of service and generosity. Uh, I, I don't want to pick a, an old wound, but a couple weeks ago when I said, who can do this? When, when no hands go up, a little frustrating. Just going to just be honest with you. It's, gonna, it's a little frustrating. I'd like to see people just, you know, um, I, I think of, of uh, the uh, Corinthian church where it said that they begged Paul to be involved in this ministry of giving. They begged. He didn't have to say, come on. They begged him to be involved in the ministry of giving. So greater levels of service and greater levels of generosity in us. Um, and then here's, here's, here's number eight. I want to see God move in mighty ways to deliver you from addictions, attitudes, and arrogance. The arrogance that says, I got this. I'm good. I don't need to grow. And you might not say it ever, but your actions speak it. And so I pray that God would move mightily in us to deliver us from that. And then the last one, this is just, it's rampant around here, guys. And I, I want to see God heal our marriages and make our families whole. It's a disaster around here right now. And, and I, I don't know, you know, I, I'm not the, hey, there's a devil behind every corner. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. But we need to, like, be in earnest prayer, and we need to protect our families because they're under massive attack. I'm like crazy, seriously crazy, right? We need to do something. We need to stand guard. Here's the point of this. The reason I have such a Christmas list is because our, our precious obligation to the Lord is to go make disciples, right? That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be a church that makes disciples of Jesus Christ. And so we're supposed to reproduce and I don't want to reproduce something ugly. I want to reproduce something beautiful here. Can someone say amen, please? Like, we, I want to reproduce something beautiful here. I want to reproduce something that's authentic and real and beautiful and lovely. Something that's sweet aroma. 
You know, I don't want to reproduce something that's rotten. That's not going to help anything, right? I want to reproduce something that's beautiful. And so um, for that to happen, and reproducing means the dream of seeing everyone in the golden triangle love Jesus and come to the Lord and worship him, right? And, and, but before that can happen, before the dream becomes a reality, something has to happen right here. Right here in us first, before that could ever happen. Before that can ever happen, something has to happen here. And that's not another program. It's not another class. You know, five steps, seven steps to world evangelism, five steps to a healthy marriage, six steps to revival. It doesn't need to happen that way. Like, action steps are good. Action steps are good. And they're necessary. And there's a process of, of us becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. I get it. And sometimes we have to just put a line in the sand and go, okay, I'm going to do this now. I'm going to make this move. I'm going to take this step of faith, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey greater. I'm going to serve more. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to try to make a compliment to some. I mean, whatever your actions are, maybe you need to get baptized. Maybe I've never taken communion before. I need to step into that. I don't know what it is. Action steps are very, very important. They're often very, very needed, just not tonight. It's not about action steps tonight. We have to choose to act according to God's word, right? We have to make a choice. All of us have the opportunity to choose every single thing you're doing. You get a choice of what you're going to do. Would, would you agree? Someone agree? Okay. We have to choose everything. But something always precedes your choice. God needs to do something in us, right? We need some change around here. We need to attack the issues here before we can go out there and reproduce because we want to reproduce something beautiful, amen? So God has to do something. So before we make a choice to, to, to be more Christ-like, to serve greater, to do any of these things that are fulfilled on my Christmas wish list for us, something precedes your choice to do the right thing. And I'd like to share it with you. Open your Bibles to Philippians 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 6. Put your eyes on God's Word. <laughs> I told you. He beat me in Connect Four today. I'm going to ride him like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, he beat me. It was a two out of three, so he beat me. Philippians 1, 6. This is what precedes your choice to do what God wants. This is what it says. This is Paul, right? So Paul says this. He says, and, and I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished in the day when Christ Jesus returns. Now this translation is a little bit different than some. Some say I'm convinced. If you have that in your translation. I'm convinced. So it's like, this is what he believes. He believes that God's going to continue to work in you. He doesn't say, hey, let's start another program. Let's start another class to try to engage you and get you to the church again. He says, I think that God's going to work on you. Now, I also know this. Don't take this just totally personal, that God began a good work in Jared. Because he's writing to a church, right? He's writing to the holy people Christ's family in Philippi. He's writing to all of them. And he says, I believe that the one who began a good work in you, Revolution, will continue to do so. Okay, I, I do. Now, I'm going to share one other verse with you. He's convinced of this. He's convinced of this. Now, when he says he's going to work in you, what does that mean? Work what way? Is he going to give you a job? Full-time? Benefits? What, what is it? Company car? Cell phone? I don't know what it means. He says he's going to continue to work. Okay, do me a favor, go to chapter 2, verse 13, just like one page over. 2.13 tells us exactly how God is going to continue this work in us. Y'all there? He says this, for God is working in you, right? Perfect setup. He sets the ball up, he's going to spike it right here. He's going to tell you exactly what it is. He is working you, what's he doing? He's giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. He's not making you do something. He's giving you the desire to even want to be good. And then he's giving you the Holy Spirit's power to actually be able to say yes to the good and no to the bad. 
So he's not making you do anything, but he's giving you the desire, because what's our desire normally? To be rotten? Rotten. Every one of us. We don't want to do good. But he's doing that. He's giving us a new desire to be like him, and then he's giving you the power to actually say yes and do it. Right? Now, before the vision for revolution is realized, before that this church and the golden triangle becomes a, a, a beacon of light to the world, God has to do something huge right here with us. He has to work on us. Paul loved his people. I'm going to read you some verses that illustrate that, but he loved his people, and he wanted desperately to see the kingdom grow. He loved Jesus, and I love my people. And I love Jesus, and I want to see the kingdom grow, so I don't want to initiate another program, right? I want to do something that, that, that will make this happen. Because I don't think five steps to, to revival is the real way that revival is going to happen. I just don't think so. And God put this on my heart. And so that's why you're not hearing about Romans. Because he invaded my world, and so I'm going to invade yours. I love you guys. I do, but I have to admit, and you guys probably already know this, that I get kind of frustrated sometimes with you. That might be the reason why the seats are empty. Except Jared. Well, you're perfect. I can't preach until I stop laughing. <laughs> You're his mother and you'd say he's not. So I'm off the hook. Stop lying. Put a Bible out and see if she puts her hand on that. <laughs> I get frustrated. I get frustrated because I see a lethargy and a complacency in our church. I do. I see flippant attitude towards sin. I see, remember I told you I have Facebook, right? I see a really often horrible witness for Jesus Christ. I just do. You, you, got, you, know, you know I do. And we all, I mean, we see it. It's terrible. I mean, I'm talking like cuss word. I mean, right on your, you know what I'm saying? Like F-bombs. I mean, seriously? Kind of, you know, I'm not an angel. But I don't see a big push towards holiness here. I don't see a tremendous desire for purity. I see a church that started out as a scumbag's welcome church, and everyone said, well, it's okay to be a scumbag, and it's okay for me to stay there, but I want to share something with you. Do you know that we never said you were scumbags? Do you all understand the real reason behind the sign? The religious people called them scumbags. Jesus did not. The ones who the religious people thought were scum, Jesus said, you come. I came for you. That's what our church is about. You're not scum. You're a child of God. You're made in his image. You're a co-heir with Christ. All that Jesus will receive, you're going to get too. You're the prized possession of all of his creation. That's who you are. You're an ambassador of Christ. You represent him. You're the little Jesus running around town here. Because last I checked, he wasn't running around town here. He sent his spirit down to invade your heart so that you would die and he would live through you. That's who you are. That's what our church needs to be. People need to look at you and you and you and all of our stupid little Facebook accounts and they need to see Jesus. They don't need to see us squabbling and fighting and cussing each other out. Sickens me. Sickens me. This might be why the seats are empty. I'm going to go down swinging, man. <laughs> go down swinging. You're like, Jared will give me a job. <laughs> I see a lot of relapse. I get the phone calls. Dan, you get the phone calls. You just want to go over to that person. You just want to go, are you kidding me? You did that. I thought you were delivered from that. What are you doing? Come on, get your head out of the sand. 
I don't know what you guys were thinking. I'm thinking ostrich. I don't like ostriches. They scare me. I see a lot of, I see a lot of strife in families and friends, or what we call friends. We shoot our wounded. We don't love each other back. When, when someone is off in sin, those that are spiritual should what? Can someone tell me? Gently, isn't that the word? Gently bring them back on track. Not F-bomb them on Facebook. I can't believe you freaking did this. What, is, what the hell's wrong? Oh, that's what you get. I mean, that's what we get. It's craziness. Who would want to come to that church? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I wouldn't go there. Yeah, the pastor hates everyone, especially Candy. Who would go to that church? <laughs> believe it or not, I know that you know, we're joking around about it, and I have a good attitude toward it tonight because we're... You know, we're here, we're just having a good time, but I get, I get a bitter root building up inside of me. I mean, I really do. And it's wrong. And so, as much as I could rip on you for your behavior and your choices, mine are just as bad. Because I allow your transgression to make me bitter, and I allow that to happen. And so I have bitterness that grows up inside of me. So when I say I have a Christmas list for you, it's for us. My Christmas list is for all of us because I need help. I need help. And, and, and so it needs to stop this, what I just mentioned about you, and it needs to stop what I do, which is get very, very frustrated and very, very bitter. It doesn't need to be that way. And we need to stop it for our own health. And we also need to stop it if we ever want to see our dream become a reality that thousands and thousands of people would rush to the altar repenting of sin and pursuing holiness. I want Jesus to be famous here. I want to push back darkness so far that you have to go earnestly looking for it to find it. I want it to be unpopular to not be a Christian here. I want, I want that to happen. I don't know if you guys are with me, but that's who I am. I'm going to share the last two weeks of this year and the first two weeks of next year talking about what I believe the, that God wants our church to do and be for the next 25 years. That's what I want to do. So I'm not going to get too deep into it tonight. But I would really, really love to live in a place where Jesus was famous and loved that's what I want to be in. That's what I want to be in. I want to love you better than I do. I don't do a very good job of loving you guys. And I want to, be a, I want to love you better. I want the Lord to bend my heart toward you in a great way. Because I, no church could grow with a preacher that doesn't love. And that, and that sounds elementary or sophomoric, like, of course, but... I struggle with that, so I'm being very transparent with you guys. Like my, my buddy, Chris, he told me a couple of years ago that if I'm going to have a successful church, I actually have to love people. Like you wouldn't necessarily think that that would be a conversation that a, a pastor would have with a buddy, that I would have to love. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? He's right. I want to love you better. I seriously want to love you better. A, a lot needs to be done here before this vision becomes a reality. And programs are just going to set us up for failure. They're going to make us exhausted. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to fail. It's never going to work. Your own self-effort, you know, like New Year's resolutions that last like, what, four minutes? And then you're just hammering, you know, cake and you're off the diet. I mean, it's just, it's never going to work. It just, it get, it's exhausting, right? Trying, trying to get better and trying to get better. No program, no effort. It's, it's never going to work. God needs to move mightily in us all for the dream to become a reality. For this Christmas wish list to become a reality, God needs to work. Just like Paul said, he needs to work mightily within us, giving us the desire and the power to do what pleases him. You, no effort, no program is going to get us there with any sustained uh, results, ever, ever. 
It needs to change. I found what I believe to be a secret for this to happen. And that's what I wanted to really share with you tonight. You know, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul says that we should pray about everything. You all know this, right? We're supposed to pray about everything. It's a high watermark. He says, uh, in the scripture, he said, we should pray about everything. We should play, pray without ceasing. And we should pray for all people. All people, everything, every minute. That's a lot. So he's got a high watermark when it comes to prayer. How many people are successful in that? No one. So, but he's called us to this, right? And I believe that the secret to revival, to the secret to, to worldwide evangelism with any level of success is found right here in the scriptures. Not another program, not five easy steps, but God needs to work in us, giving us the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Paul prayed in obedience to God. God said pray about everything, so Paul would pray, but he also prayed in obedience, but he prayed in love. Paul, who's this like hardcore evangelist, you know, he was whipped and beaten and beat with a stick and thrown in jails and not like our jails here. They were like, you know, like caves with rats and duty. Like that's where they hung out. It was disgusting and they were, he was shipwrecked and he was starved and beaten and he almost died a bunch of times. And he's going around town, he's planting churches and appointing elders and preaching and he didn't care if he got beat up for it. He got beat up all the time. He was a tough guy, right? But he loved his people. He loved his people. Do me a favor. Look in Acts chapter 20. You're going to see this. We know that he loved his people because he tells us so. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. You got it memorized, Scanlon? That's what I thought. <laughs> 20, 28. You notice the heading of the section is that he's meeting with the, the leaders in the church in Ephesus. And we're going to read a bunch in Ephesians how this all fleshes out. He's meeting with the leaders, and in verse, um, what did I say, 17, 22, where am I? 20, 28, 28. Look what he says. N notice the love he has for his people. He said, so guard yourselves and God's people feed and shepherd God's flock. He's talking to the elders that he appointed there. He's like, take care of these people, remember? Take care of them. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Feed them and shepherd them. That means protect them, teach them, help them be healthy, nurse them back to health. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as elders. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even, this is terrible, but it's true. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. Now this is the part. This is where you really see his love. He's being practical right there and saying just, just watch out for these certain things. But then look what he says. Here. He just shows his heart. He reminds me. He says, hey, remember the three years that I was with you? My constant watch and care over you night and day. So you see, he cared for them, right? He cared for them. But then look, at the, look, look how he closes it out. He says, and my many tears for you. Here's this tough guy, Paul, who's going around getting whipped, beaten, put in jail, starved, shipwrecked, right? And he's crying over the people. He feels just the same way I told you. I feel your pain. We feel each other's pains and suffering and strife, right? And Paul's like, I feel it too. And I, it, it brings me to tears. He cried for his people. He loved his people. And so he did something for them. And it wasn't just a program. It wasn't just five easy steps to sanctification. That's not what he did. Yes, sir? I was in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Where am I? I'm in Eustace, and I'm on this carpet. <laughs> so he loved his people. <laughs> Trust me, he loved them, and I love you. Okay, so here's the thing. He loved God, 
And he was obedient to God to pray for people, and he loved his people, so he guarded them and he prayed for them. And so, because he loved God and because he loved his people, he asked for God to move in them. That was the greatest gift he could give them. Not another program, but, and not another class, but that God would move, that God would fulfill what he said, that he would give them the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That's what he wanted for his people, to bring glory to God's name and to bring blessing to his people. And that's what I've been doing. So I'm reading this thing. I'm like, God, what do you want me to talk about? Where do you want us to go? We need a couple. We need something different. We need a break from Romans, Lord. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And he leads me right here to the book of Ephesians. And I start reading as Paul begins to pour out this love and obedience to God and a love to his people. And he wants to see the kingdom advance. Amen? And we do too. I do too. And so look, this is what he does. He just starts to pray for his people that God would move mightily in their, in their lives. And so that's what I started doing. I read through this, and I'm like, I started jotting down these prayers, and I started praying these things for you. That's what I want to see. I want to see the vision become a reality, but before it ever becomes a reality, these crazy, amazing things have to happen in you before it can happen abroad. And so he starts pr praying and praying and praying, constantly, it says. And so that's what I've been doing. And I'm going to continue to do it. And tonight... I'm going to do that. I'm just going to pray for you. And I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to take Paul's pastoral prayers for his people that he loved, and I've made them my own, and I'm going to share some things, and then I'm going to actually just pray for these things for you because I think that that's the greatest gift I could give you is that God would move mightily in your life, and I think it's the greatest gift that God could give me that he would move mightily in my life so I would get rid of the bitterness and the frustration that I have. I want a pastor with joy. I want a pastor with, with, with joy. I want to be happy about what I'm doing. I don't always have to be happy. Paul wasn't always happy when he's, when he's in jail, right? But what did he have? He had joy. I want joy. I want joy. Even when things are rough, I want joy. And so I'm going to share these things with you. And I'm going to pray these things over you. The verses where I'm getting these will be up on the screen. And you can jot them down, but what I really want you to do, honestly, is that while I'm actually praying for you, I don't want you to be looking at the screen. I don't even want you to be looking at me. I'm asking God to do something in your life. And he said that the, the prayers of a righteous man bring back much profit. It's not that I'm righteous, it's just that the Jesus Christ is. And he's imputed that righteousness to me when I bowed my knee to him. So because I'm praying, it's like Jesus praying to his Father. So what I would like you to do, this is kind of crazy. You know sometimes you, and you don't have to do this, but I'm just going to ask you to maybe do it, because I think that sometimes it helps to, to just follow through what I'm going to tell you. You know sometimes when you pray, what do you normally do? Put your head down and you do this, right? A lot of times you're asking God for something, and you put your head down because you kind of want to be humble before him. Tonight, I'm asking God to do something for you. I'm not asking you to ask him to do anything. I'm asking God to do something for and in you. So instead of putting your head down, hold your head up. Hold your head up. You can close your eyes. Don't look at me, please. But I want you to just, like you're, like you're just looking up to heaven, just pour down on me. This is what I want, Lord. I want what he's saying for me. Give it to me. You know? If you'd do that, that'd be awesome. I want to start here. In Ephesians 1.16, Paul started the, this letter out by saying that he always thanks God for his people. But he doesn't tell them what for. He says, when I pray, I... I just thank God for you. But he doesn't give any clarity. So it kind of leaves it open, doesn't it? He left it open for me, and I'd like to pray for you the way I've been praying, and will continue to do so. <laughs> Father,
with all my heart, I don't believe we need another program. With all my heart, I believe that we need you to move mightily in us. To change the climate in our community. We need you to change the climate here. I like Paul, Lord. I've been praying for my friends and family here at Revolution. And I thank you for them. I thank you for two things, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for saving them. I thank you, Lord, for giving them a future and a hope. I thank you, Lord, for giving them your Holy Spirit to guide them, to convict them, to help them. I'm thankful, Lord, that you saved us, that we're part of your family. I'm also thankful, Lord, that you brought them into my life. My life is extremely colorful because of these people. I don't live a boring life. I may live a simple life, but I certainly don't live a boring one. And it's because of each and every one of these people. And so, Lord, I thank you for bringing them into my life. Look here. Romans 1 tells us that when God created all that you see, that no one's with excuse, that you all know that he is. You can see his power and his beauty. Just walk outside and see it. Look in your kids' eyes, you see it. But it also tells us that we look at that and we don't respond well to that, that we don't honor him, that we don't acknowledge him for who he really is, that we all fall short of what he really wants us, the way he really wants us to respond. So we respond with all these false, crazy religions and rules and cults and all these foolish things. The world around you is trying to teach you what deity looks like, how to live your life, what religion you should follow, what this God really is, that, that somehow that the Spirit of God is just like some, some, like the force, like on Star Wars. It's madness. And so I want to pray for you because I want you to be able to see through all that junk and see God for who he really is, the God of the Bible. Let me pray for you. Lord, um, again, just like Paul, Lord, um, Lord, we are bombarded in this, in this culture with all these false images of who you are. All these false ideas of how you operate. All these, this, these false theories and hypothesis on evolution and that we were monkeys and that you're some ethereal being that doesn't really exist. You're some spirit in the sky that just sprinkled fairy dust all over nothing and there was. That somehow you change and that based on our cultural norms is how you just adjust to our whims. That's not who you are. You're the rock that never moves. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give every man, woman, and child in this church the spirit of wisdom and insight so that they might know you well. Give them a spirit of wisdom and insight to be able to discern let them pick up on the counterfeit and cast it away and grab a hold of the real thing, of the authentic God. Help us to find out who you really are, to not be prone to accept every new high-sounding philosophy and religious thing that sounds good. Oh, that sounds good. I'll take a piece of this and I'll take a piece of that and I'll put together my own. Help us to get rid of that. 
Help us to, to realize who you really are. Lord, that would help so many things. So many of our mess-ups here as a church are, come right out of that, that we don't know who you really are. So open up our spirit to recognize who you really are. I mentioned a little bit ago that we would have a, um, a deeper concern for sin. Sin is rampant in this church. And we excuse it by putting it into classes. Anyone in here ever heard of a little white lie? God never has. He's never heard of that. I can tell you what, if he's heard of it, it wasn't from his dictionary. He didn't make it up. Do you ever hear people say, well, that's just the way I'm wired. God understands because that's just the way he made me. And we clap, like, no one's killing and robbing banks and blowing up stores. You know what I'm saying? So we're, we don't do that, but we got no problem with our, and I'm, listen, I'm guilty right here of my foul mouth. We, we, we tell little lies because we want to get things. We want to be the one who's the traffic cop that decides what comes into our life and what doesn't come into our life. And so we will lie to get something that we want and we will lie to keep something that we don't think we want from us. We want to play traffic cop in our life. The reason being is because you haven't put God where he belongs. You don't believe that, that the best thing will come if you absolutely trust and obey his word. That's the problem, myself included. You don't believe that if you absolutely open the book, read what it says, and do what it says, literally do it, that the best things will come into your life, and the things that don't need to come into your life, he'll filter them out. I want that, so I'll lie. Don't you dare tell me you're without sin here, because we all do it. There's an, uh, a man in your church, he's about to tell you a story. He's an elder in your church, and you probably think, you know what? He should know better. Maybe. Yeah. Well, we all should know better. We all should know better. He's willing to, Dan's willing to share. Come on, just, you can stand up. You can just listen to him. He's going to share a story that's a perfect illustration that happened in his life where he didn't trust God for the best in his life. Good. You're a horrible person. So she's like, that's too bad. 
Larry's getting really old, and we're looking to some looking for somebody to give his basically his workshop. Of <laughs> thousands of dollars worth of tools, like nice tool, uh, a wood shop. Shop. Their garage is. I've been eyeballing these tools since we lived there. So I'm thinking he's getting old. They're going to sell them eventually. I'm going to make an offer on these tools. She came over and was offering to hand them to me. A whole shop. And I, I backtracked really quick. <laughs> No, no, well, well, you know, the reason I don't is because I don't have all the tools. <laughs> she, she saw through that. No, no, no. Give them to somebody that can really use them. I'm just, I just looked down. I'm trying to tell God, right, right down my neck, laughing. <laughs> yeah. I, I just laughed at myself. <laughs> yeah, that's what he got out of it. Do me a favor. <laughs> Say God wants to bless me. Look at the person next to you and tell him God wants to bless you. Well, he was trying to bless Dan. He's trying to bless us. But we, we, we do what the Bible says. We, 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 treat his, we treat Christ's work as common. We, 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 don't, we don't believe that what he says he wants to do, that he would. So we try to lie our way through it. We try to sin our way through life and expect God's blessing. I have, I have a news flash for you. He doesn't bless unfaithfulness. Amen. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Me and God have a way. We got a thing. You hear that a lot, right? You don't have a thing. You don't have a thing. You know what you have? You have this and then what you've made up in your mind. That's it. God wants to bless you and you're keeping it from happening. God wants to bless this church and we're keeping it from happening. The eyes of the Lord go back and forth across the earth looking to strengthen those whose hearts are completely His. That's the church he wants to fill. When he can look down at his people and go, her heart is mine, his heart is mine, your heart is mine. I can use these people and I know that if I send people to that church, they're going to really meet me, not Gumby. Not some conjured up God that we've made up in our world. It's foolishness, it's madness. And that's what we do. That's what we do. We treat Christ as common let me pray for you, please, so we can let God work on us. Not another program, Lord. Not another five easy step sermon. Lord, we need you to help us with our flippant attitude towards sin. Lord, we need you to help us to be more obedient. We need you to help us to be more tolerant of those people that are around us that are sinning. Your word tells us that the people that aren't believers are sinning because they don't have the spirit. They don't have, the, they don't have Christ's mind yet. They can't, they can't discern the things of the Spirit. They don't even have the Spirit. But those of us that do, we know better. Help us, to, to help us with our unbelief. Help, help us to trust you more. Help us to really believe that all things work out for the good to those who love the Lord. Help us to know that we don't need to lie. We don't need to be the traffic cop trying to decide what comes in and what goes out and what doesn't come into our lives. That you're very good at that. And we don't need to help you. We have our own job description. Go make disciples. Go pray. Go baptize people. You're the one who gives us the desire and the power to please you. You're the one who decides what comes into our life. You're the one who decides that if we, we need to, to, to stop working so hard, maybe you collapse one of our lungs so we'll stop for goodness sakes. You're the one who does this stuff. Help us trust you. In the spirit of what Paul said in Ephesians 1.18, Lord, I pray from the bottom of my heart. I pray that revolution hearts would be flooded with your light. That you would flood our hearts with your light. 
And in so doing, that you would expel all the darkness, all the sin from us. Help us not focus on our sin, but focus on you. Our job is not to purge sin from our lives. Your job is to purchase sin, purge sin from our lives. So flood our hearts with light and expel all darkness from us. So we can understand this confident hope you've given to your holy people. And as the waves of your flood wash over them, they will comprehend the rich and glorious inheritance you've given them. Lord, you had an inheritance for Dan. And he blew it. Help us all to comprehend this glorious and rich inheritance, all that you want to do. You want to bless us. You want to bless us. You want to bless us, Father. And we get in the way. Help us to realize that we don't need to play traffic cop. You're well able to do these things. Ask this in Jesus' name. day when I see all that you have for me, when I see you face to face, they're surrounded by your grace, all my fears are swept away in the light of your embrace, where your love I am free where the streets are paved in gold in your presence sealed in gold that the songs of heaven rise to you alone no weeping no
to your name for eternity all my heart will give all the glory to your name come on sing out for eternity things that I uh, see here in the church a lot and I think it needs to get better I see a lot of mental defeat before the thing actually comes into your life I see a lot of I can't I can't what if I don't know how to say no this won't work it's pre-assumed failure like obeying, Kyle got up here last week and shared a very basic Kyle style, obey. That the best thing happens when you obey. Would anyone agree? But yet it's just a good theory, isn't it? See, we, we say we believe it, but yet we live it as if it's a good theory. It sounds good, but... Come on, right? We do. The scriptures say that if the Son has set you free, come on now. The Son has set you free. You're free indeed. It says in Romans that because of what Jesus did on the cross, He put to death sin in your life. He put to death sin in your life. It's already victory for you. Do you understand? He wants to open up your eyes to the awareness of this, to the reality that sin is dead to you, that you don't have to say no. You don't have to say yes to it. You can say no to it. But we don't. Choice. 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 Tell your neighbor it's your choice. Seriously, come on now. Tell someone. Look at them and tell them it's your choice. You can choose. I can choose not to sin. Tell someone. I can choose not to sin. Come on. I can choose not to sin. I can choose not to sin. I can choose not to sin. You can choose not to sin, Harry. We can choose not to sin. <laughs> we all should look at Dan. You ready? One, two, three. You can choose not to sin. New Leaf has services at the same time. You can probably still make it. I'm just <laughs> I do love them too. They're not as lenient as us. You better shape up. <laughs> Let me pray for you. Close your eyes. Don't look at me, please. I might get silly up here. I like that guitar. That sounds good.
Lord, thank you for, um, for what you've done already tonight. I know that you're moving here. I know that you're moving in the hearts of everybody that's here right now. Your Holy Spirit is convicting us of truth. It's leading us there to all the truth that we need so we can respond well to you. It's convicting us of sin. It's convicting us of the coming judgment which should give us a sense of urgency to our holiness. Lord, I pray that these saints here at Revolution Church will understand the incredible greatness of your power for us who believe in you. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead and sat him on the throne of honor at the Father's right hand. I say that again, just to receive this, folks. Listen. That you would understand the greatness of the power that you have for us who believe. The same power that raised Christ from the dead. That power lives in you. Receive that power and make a good choice.